Yep. Good morning and welcome to this, the 18th meeting of 2014 of the European External Relations Committee. I'm going to make the usual request that mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off unless you're using your iPad for um, the meeting papers. Um, can I note some apologies for today? Um, Jamie um, McGregor uh, won't be joining us today and we won't be having a substitute either. So, moving on swiftly to agenda item one, which is the Brussels Bulletin. And you'll see that it's um, a very detailed Brussels Bulletin uh, this time, um, with some uh, uh, you know, quite interesting things. There's obviously lots of changes going on at European level right now. Commissioners being interviewed and, um, and uh, different uh, strands and strategies and, and policies emerging. So, I'm um, happy to take any questions, comments or queries on the Brussels Bulletin. Willie Coffey. Oh, thanks, Convener. I, yes, uh, my attention was drawn to the, the information in page two, uh, the information that you mentioned there about the, the appointment of the commissioners, and you, you can see that there's some clear uh, and focused themes and projects that they'll be concentrating their efforts on, jobs, growth and investment, of course, and uh, connected to digital single market, which, as you know, Convener, for some time I'm, I'm particularly interested in how this develops within the European Union and how it might affect... Um, Scotland, I just wonder if there's a, a future opportunity for us to to do a little bit more work and understand just quite what their role and remit might be with regard to the digital single market. And I think that would be a useful piece of work for the committee to engage with. Yep. Yep. Hans Allen. That, that's that, that was the exact point. I was actually wanting to make sure we're on we're on track with that one. Um, I think that's important, particularly the digital industry. I think is is, is a favourite of both of us, and I think it's it's high time we we try to roll it, as much of that out as we can. So I, I'm with you in that. I think absolutely yeah, yeah, a priority for us. Okay, Claire Adams. Um, it's just a comment. I am really on the the European Commission selection process, um, and observing um, you know the possible candidates and things. I'm struck that the. Um, isn't a lot of gender balance, to Indeed. say the least, in Indeed. the selection <laughs> process. And I was just wondering if that's something we could um, look into, um, what qualities and uh, mechanisms, if any, are used in actually um, proposing the, the commissioners. OK. Yeah, that did um, pique my interest as well. Rod Campbell. Yeah, no, I, I, I was a very comprehensive bulletin. Um, I kind of lost the thread as exactly where we are with the Lord Hill's hearings. So I don't know if um, Katie can actually update us on Lord Hill's actual current position, still going through the hearings. Is, is that? Yeah. We can get an update on that. Yeah. And obviously interested if he's going to have the financial service brief. Um, uh, I'm getting particularly interested in the fourth money laundering directive and progress on, on that. Uh, and uh, anything that we can find out about that would be uh, of interest to me personally. Yep, OK. Thank you very much. Um, just a, a quick comment on and Willie Coffey's uh, question. Um, we, the, the discussion we had last uh, week about our work programme, um, so there's a few ideas that were brought up in that, obviously by yourself and others. Um, so we're working that through the proposal um, and hopefully we'll have something that will meet your satisfaction. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Billy. Could back, back in again. Um, I notice also in the report there's a, there's a mention of uh, one or two awards to, to Scotland, for example, to support projects in Scotland under the transport infrastructure heading. It would be really helpful if, I mean, this is a great report, what I would find really helpful if there was some kind of summary page, perhaps, of awards made to, to Scotland uh, from time to time under whatever heading. It was a theme that our late friend and colleague Helen Eady used to bring up at this mm -hmm. committee to keep an eye on what awards Scotland was or was not receiving. I think that would be really useful. And it complements what our other colleague Jamie McGregor said last week about strengthening, strengthening the case for Europe and being able to articulate and show the positive advantages that we get. There's lots of good work going on here, but sometimes it's useful to just summarise it in terms of the awards and the various programmes and the value of them to, to Scotland. I think that would be really helpful. Yep. So whoever compiles the bulletin, it would be lovely if you would make some contact with them and ask if that's possible. 
We can we can do that. The Scotland Europa um, they put together a, a, quite a bit of work, and I expect this to be, you know, uh, getting heftier and heftier over the next few months as, as you know key themes and, and policy emerges from from the Commission um, and the European Parliament. But yeah, def definitely that would be something that would be interesting. Um, it also feeds into the the work that we do as far as. You know, structural funds and, and, and where that money is coming and where it's going and how it's being spent yeah. um, and the, the six monthly updates we have for the Scottish Government on that, so that would complement that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Rod? Yeah, one, yes, one other one I wanted to stress. I thought it was quite encouraging, the, the comments in relation to the impact of the Erasmus student programme, saying that they were, uh, uh, students who have been on that were far like, less likely to experience long-term unemployment. That's quite un encouraging. And I was also encouraged by the, the, the next comment that uh, the, uh, the uh, commissioner-elect would be looking at labour mobility as well as uh, just employment issues. And, and um, uh, the idea that somehow kind of people moving across Europe for jobs was a bad thing is kind of not borne out by this suggestion from the commission. I think that would be a very interesting topic to kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, um, I think as well it's one of the, the key um, policy areas, the key aims of the Italian presidency and we've got the ambassador later this morning so it may be um, something we can start to investigate with, with him when he's here um, but I think you're absolutely absolutely right um, Rod on that Chair, can I Chair, um, Hans Allen. Come back on back that. that You will recall that uh, we were making great efforts to make, make sure that we had somebody in place that would help organisations apply for European funding. Uh, I've not really had a report back here to, to, uh, about how that's progressing. Um, have they actually applied physically? Have they assisted any organisations? And have, whether they've actually been successful or unsuccessful uh, in their bid? Uh, I would very much like to have some sort of feedback of, of that at perhaps the next meeting. Yeah, I think that's, that's that. the Scottish Government person. Yeah. 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 Um, we we endeavoured to look into that before, this didn't we? Yeah. Was instrumental in making, creating that post in the first instance, and it was for a specific task. We just want to see how that's progressing. Got the cabinet secretary this morning on the EU strategy as well. So it's maybe... I wouldn't want to put it in that position. I'm not sure she would have that detailed okay. knowledge okay. that a report yeah, would come. Yeah, it's more likely to be John Swinney's portfolio. Yeah. I'm quite happy to put it in a difficult position if you want me to, but I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, are members content to um, uh, send the Brussels Bulletin to our subject committees, again highlighting to the subject yeah. committee some of the points that we've raised this morning? Yep, happy to do that. Excellent. Thank you very much. And yeah, I'm going to suspend briefly to allow the Cabinet Secretary to get in okay. to her seat.
Welcome back to the External and, um, European and External Relations Committee. Uh, moving on to agenda item two, um, we are covering the Scottish Government's plan for European engagement this morning. I intend to um, run the session till about ten past ten. Is that OK for you, Cabinet Secretary? Yeah. Um, if I'd, like, I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External um, Affairs, Fiona Hislop, who is um, assisted by Craig Egner, who's the head of the European Relations Team at the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, I, I know you're going to talk, talk to us about um, the, the Scottish Government's European priorities, if you want to go ahead with your okay, opening statement. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to... To speak. Obviously, this uh, session comes at a very important time in European affairs. Uh, the European parliamentary hearings concluded this week for the new commission uh, under the new president, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. We expect the new commission to be formed uh, next week, uh, sorry, next month, following approval by the European Parliament. We understand there may be one um, uh, proposal that has not been accepted. Uh, so the Scottish Government will watch closely as the um, new commission set out their new agenda. Uh, the committee have long been interested in the Scottish Government's EU action plan. Uh, the current uh, action plan framework was established in 2009. It's been updated regularly since then. It doesn't seek to address every aspect of EU business which the Scottish Government covers. Rather, it pulls out some key areas. Indeed, our EU business has evolved quite significantly from where we were in 2009. We're refreshing the action plan and we'll take account of the new Commission and the new European Parliament following the May elections. Uh, we hope the committee uh, itself will wish to be involved in the work uh, that we undertake uh, to refresh our action plan. Um, we continue to publish updated annexes on the action plan twice a year to coincide with the rotating presidency. Uh, we share these with the committee and I, I hope you find them useful. Um, the latest annex was published in August. Uh, it covers our work under the Greek presidency and looks ahead to the current Italian presidency. presidency. There is a positive overlap of the Scottish Government priorities and those of the Italian Presidency, as highlighted in the Action Plan. Uh, Scotland and Italy have similar priorities for engaging with Member States, the EU institutions and other EU stakeholders. Um, I met with the Italian Ambassador yesterday. Uh, as you will be aware, there are over uh, 6,000 Italians living in Scotland and our two nations have rich cultural tourism, trade and industry ties. Uh, I was in Siena at the weekend speaking at the Pontignano Conference, the third uh, consecutive year I've attended and of course there was great interest in the Scottish referendum uh, which obviously is the greatest democratic experience in Scotland's history and has, has many lessons that people are interested in. Uh, turning to the Italian presidency of the EU, uh, this is the first of a trio with Latvia and Luxembourg. Uh, our EU teams in Scotland and Brussels are, are working closely with the uh, Italian presidency, the EU institutions, the UK representation and other EU, uh, key EU stakeholders to ensure that uh, Scotland's priorities are communicated across all three council presidencies. Priorities uh, areas for the Italian presidency, uh, they have highlighted three priorities areas for their presidency and you'll hear from the ambassador later. Um, the first is a, a, a Europe of opportunities uh, concerning economic and financial activities. Uh, one key area where the Scottish Government is seeking to engage with the Italian president, presidency is on youth uh, employment, where of course Scotland has the only youth employment minister cabinet secretary in the EU. Um, the Scottish Government has been marshalling uh, over £143 million from the period 12, uh, 13 to 14, 15 to support young people uh, into work and towards work. And our efforts are making a difference. Uh, in 2013, the proportion of 16 to 19 year olds in Scotland who were not in education, employment or training decreased in all 32 local authority areas. And bearing in mind the period we've gone through, that's quite significant. And I know there's interest across Europe in, in learning and sharing from our experience. Other areas, obviously, in the uh, opportunities agenda are on energy and climate change, the single market, a digital economy, uh, action on industrial policy and financing for growth. The second area is in relation to a Europe of rights. Um, the other priority area of a Europe for rights covers justice and home affairs issues, including immigration. And, of course, the importance of the immigration issue was clear in the results of the European elections with the rise in the popularity of parties um, in Europe promoting an anti-immigration agenda. It's also uh, clearly important to the Italians with the ongoing humanitarian uh, situation in the Mediterranean. But we agree that this is a, a long-term strategic issue requiring all of the EU uh, to take responsibility. 
Uh, with regard to justice, uh, we expect further progress on the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which started off hugely complicated. Uh, we understand it's now in better shape, as well as the data protection package. A number of member states uh, share Scotland's concerns about um, the proposal in the EPPO. However, negotiations are progressing in a positive direction, with more power being given to the national level and greater flexibility in structure. While the UK is, will not be participating in this measure, it is an important priority for the Scottish Government, given it is likely that Scottish law enforcement and prosecution authorities will have to work with the EPPO once established. I know that's an area that the committee has already taken interest in. Thirdly, the priority uh, for the presidency of a union of global engagement encompasses the external dimension of the EU. That This includes trade and crisis management, where the Commission will present their package of enlargement and the presidency will work on free trade with a clear focus on agreeing the EU-US transatlantic trade and investment partnership. That's something I, I know also that the committee has a great deal of interest in. Clearly, the UK is one of those um, countries that will benefit more, most from the uh, TTIP uh, agreements and within the UK, Scotland is well placed to benefit in terms of jobs and services. Um, so we'll obviously continue to look at that as well as continuing to, to identify the EU work on developing the approach to trade uh, with Asia. The priorities of the Italian presidency are not only short-term goals for the, the six-month uh, council calendar, but are also benchmarks for the incoming commission mandate, who will be seeking progress and change across the EU for the next five years. So our engagement over this period is not just about the short term, it's also about the setting of the commission agenda for going forward over the longer piece. Finally, um, the question of EU reform will be present. Um, this follows, obviously, again, um, some of the politics that's happening in terms of anti-European parties uh, gaining seats in the May elections for Europe. And, of course, within the UK's uh, with the, U the Conservative Party's in-out referendum promise. Uh, the Scottish Government is opposed to an in-out referendum on EU membership in 2017, where exit from the EU carries a significant risk for growth and jobs in Scotland. Uh, we believe that reform is best achieved from within the EU, and we've set out in our proposals for EU reform, which have circulated to the committee um, earlier in the, the summer, um, the uh, proposals that we have where we can do this within uh, existing treaties but also can progress reform without risking um, the important aspects that are important to Scotland. OK, that was um, my sprint, no marathon. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, thanks very much. A lot packed into uh, the, the, the work you do. There's a couple of things that, that, that jumped out to me, and, and you're absolutely correct. The, the, the committee is taking quite a keen interest in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, um, and you mentioned the benefits that... that could come from that um, um, agreement. Um, we'd obviously been lobbied very, very heavy, uh, heavily about the pitfalls and the problems that can come with a, a transatlantic trade and investment partnership, um, commonly known as TTIP. Um, and I was wondering if you know, if you can maybe give us an update. We've we've had some communications with both the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Cabinet Secretary for Health on uh, some of the concerns that have been raised uh, via this committee. And I wonder if you could give us an upset. I know there's a, uh, an update. There's a GIMC due soon, and and I know that, that maybe it will be on the agenda for that. Um, in, in terms of uh, where we are, I, I think in looking at TTIP, I think it's going to be important to look at both sides, the benefits and the problems. I think if we just respond to and react to the concerns about it, I think we would be um, you know, missing the responsibility we have to ensure that jo jobs and growth are supported. So we as a government are supportive of the of proposals um, for TTIP, but it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't require close scrutiny and the purpose and, and, and agenda. You know, if you look at in terms of uh, inward investment, uh, the strong um, US investment in Scotland for jobs and growth, some of which were just um, outlined by the First Minister earlier this week in terms of our progress. Uh, we, Scotland has seen one of the best uh, inward investment uh, periods uh, you know, since devolution, I think, in terms of uh, the experience we've had, uh, particularly in the last uh, the last year. So, I think it's going to be important to weigh up in looking at this the the the, the, the posi you know the positives in terms of the trade opportunities, reducing some of the the costs to particularly small businesses. Remember, one of our challenges within um, Scotland is to internationalise a lot of our SMEs to make sure that they can do more in terms of exports. And I know that's an issue that a number of you have raised with me. So that that is the opportunity for Scottish business, Scottish firms, Scottish jobs 
to be able to export more and we've got to help and support that. However, on the, the, the downside, which I think is, is where you're coming from and where you've, you've had approaches, are the risks that TTIP could potentially have for some of our key services. So in relation to health, for example, um, you'll, you'll be aware that the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing is, is in correspondence with both the Secretary of State for Health and the European Commission regarding cast iron uh, assurances that whatever the approach to the provision of health services in the rest of the UK, TTIP will not affect the Scottish Government's ability to determine how NHS services are provided. So we, we want to be constructive in engagement both with the UK Government and with the European Commission on TTIP, but we're quite clear there are some issues, particularly around the importance of public provision of health services in Scotland, that we feel very, very strongly about. Um, I'd previously raised it, uh, the issue in TTIP with the um, UK Government. There is a JMC in Europe. We don't normally share um, agenda items uh, and we normally report afterwards, but I can confirm that the meeting on Monday, uh, which I unfortunately will not be attending, um, Rosanna Cunningham, the Minister for Legal Affairs, will be attending. Um, that will be one of the issues that's on the agenda with the, the UK Government. OK, thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, we'll keep a, a close eye on, on that one. Just very quickly, uh, another um, um, thing that sort of jumped out to me was um, around about the ECHR and some of the proposals that are coming from the UK Government to repeal um, the, that legislation. Um, and there seems to be a lot of debate this week in, in a lot of academic circles and legal circles on the impact that that would have on this place, um, how the Parliament actually works, but how the Government is required to work as far as legislation goes as well. And I wonder if you could give us some uh, insight into the Government's thinking on that. Well, uh, again, um, the uh, Minister of Rosanna Cunningham answered a question in Parliament this week on, on the issue. It's something that we feel very strongly about. We would not agree to um, any consent motion or so motion um, from, from the UK Government that would uh, remove uh, uh, any aspects of human rights from, from our provisions. This Parliament, in its very being, was established uh, to be compliant with ECHR. It's something, I think, that we've been very proud of. I, th I, think, there's, I think there are two issues to this. I think one is the practicalities of the actual policies and the impacts. But the second one, which I think is probably more important, is the politics of this. Um, from the UK's position, you know, it's being marginalised in so many different ways in terms of its attitude towards Europe. But to, to, to remove or to walk away from human rights and the ECHR and its application within this country would send out a signal that would further marginalise the UK, not just within Europe, but further afield. And why is that important? Well, from the UK's perspective, I mean, they can speak for themselves, but obviously as a, a continuing part of the UK, we have an interest in this. Um, you know, from a UK's perspective, you know, their influence in terms of empire or the economy or indeed in, in many ways the military might has been diminished um, over decades. But one of the areas where the UK has a reputation is in terms of fairness and, and justice and value and the rule of law and human rights. And if that's one of their aspects that in their international foreign policy they think they can use to influence other countries that are in... Um, it, 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 with challenges themselves, that completely and utterly diminishes any moral authority that they have if they walk away from this. So, to me, there are two aspects. One is the, the kind of practical implications for what it means constitutionally and in terms of, of law, but I think the imperative is actually about the message of what we stand for. Um, one of the, the areas that's been interesting in the short time we've had devolution is the reputation that Scotland has built up in relation to the importance of human rights on a whole variety of areas. But but not least also how you can implement them. And the Human Rights Action Plan, for example, um, there was a session earlier in the summer that we hosted um, in Scotland House in Brussels where we brought together um, experts from across uh, Europe who are interested in what we do and how we do it. So what is happening with the UK is not only just counter to the practicalities of the constitutional setup of this place and potentially other areas, and I'm sure not only will... I mean, I, I'm not sure that it happens very often that you take evidence from the Parliament <laughs> itself. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you'll be interested in taking evidence from ministers and particularly yeah. um, Rosanna Cunningham, who's had a lead on this, but I think <coughs> maybe this is one of the few instances where... Um, I'm not sure how the interaction of the committee um, taking evidence from its own parliament, but there's an issue for the presiding officer and this place. Um, and I think that needs to be identified. We have um, we have clearly taken this very seriously and communicating it to the UK government. Not least again, um, I can intimate that this is a, will be a subject that will be raised on Monday with the UK government. Uh, but I, I think in examining it, we, we should 
we should look at it in two dimensions. And maybe this committee, as the you know, external affairs, should look at it not just in terms of the policy making on devolved areas, uh, but actually about the reputational aspects and the implications for Scotland, but also for the rest of the UK elsewhere. Um, for those accession countries or other countries looking to join the, the bench, the bar, in terms of human rights is very important. And the idea that the UK would be the only country, the first country in the world to go backwards in relation to human rights, I think is, is fairly uh, incomprehensible. But uh, perhaps I should finish at that before I get over a few of my, <laughs> on my concern. OK, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I've got Rod Campbell then, Hans Alla. Following on that point, um, Cabinet, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, morning. Obviously, it's, it's been a, a, a matter under discussion for about as long as I can remember whether the, the EU itself would uh, accede to the European Convention on Human Rights. It does seem to me that in your portfolio, with your portfolio, you're entitled to have discussions with the UK government about its current position on that. But one presumes that uh, if it ever got to the point of that, that being a, 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 a serious issue, that the UK government would uh, simply try and veto that um, so that the EU would never actually sign up to it. But um, that's just kind of an added uh, interest to the, the whole convention anyway. So. Well, I mean, it's an interesting perspective as to, you know, do they think it's a good thing across Europe um, and what they think internally? Now, they would need to be consistent with their positions, but I think this is the opportunity to try and, uh, and shape that itself. Um, I, I'm not sure that's something that I would encourage them to, to think about. I mean, you're right to ask the question, but in terms of our position, we can uh, clearly, and we would, if that, in terms of what comes up on, on, on council agendas as, as they go forward, um, we do have the opportunity at the JMC Europe to influence that. So clearly, from our point of view, we would want to, 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 to see the extension, but that might not be our UK position. But that's the point about devolution is being able to try and um, advance you know, the, the, the case and the cause. But you know, it's, it, it shows the limitations of what we can do if they turn around and say, no, that we, we're going to veto that. But uh, I, I think we're getting to territory that you know, they can speak for themselves rather than we speak yeah. for them. OK. OK. Hans Allah. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you've said a number of very interesting things about the um, human rights uh, and, and how that would affect us. And you, you've drawn attention to the diminishing uh, military uh, might that the UK has. And uh, also, I think one of the big issues for me is that we don't have a common uh, immigration policy across Europe. And I think that's always been a... a, a a bone and of contention for me is that how can we be a part of a European Union, have free borders to a degree, and then not have the same immigration policy? I mean, it, it, it works against the face of things. And, and human rights are affected by, by people. We've seen boats turned away in the Mediterranean by European countries who champion the human rights cause, but practically they don't practice it. Um, the difference between the UK and perhaps some of the other European partners is that the UK actually honours the European, uh, sorry, the human rights um, policy. And I think one of the issues for us in the UK is because we don't have a common immigration policy, uh, it's very tempting to to play around with the uh, human rights um, bill. And I think that's that's a dangerous and a slippery slope to go down. We've seen human rights being eroded on a daily basis in terms of how we um, arrest people, how we detain people. We're, we're just making rules on the hoof as we go along. Uh, and, and, and what's actually happening is we're, we're infringing on people's human rights. Um, and so we either do this the right way or we do it this the wrong way, as some of our European partners are doing it. We're just willy-nilly making, taking actions without actually following the human rights uh, um, bill that we've all signed up to. So therefore, I think it's right to look at it, absolutely. But in terms of um, w where we would stand with that, I mean, we're a, we're, we're a UK government, and, uh, and uh, eventually we will all have our representations through our MPs to, to, to have our uh, um, views represented at Parliament. I agree with you. I don't think we should be diluting it any further. I think we've, we've diluted it as far as I would like to see it go, and I think beyond. However, there are issues. The world is changing very rapidly, and there are very serious issues. We, we see Kurdistan 
Uh, we've seen shelling between India and Pakistan only a couple of days ago. Uh, there are huge issues uh, around the world, and um, I think how that affects people in different countries is, is very important. And we are not actually interpreting the human rights um, and the immigration policies the way they really ought to be Im uh, interpreted. We've got people in, in Europe, for example, who are wanting to come to the UK. Now, they're, they're already in Europe, and they're in European countries. And if they're uh, asylum seekers, that's where they should be. That's what they, they, the, the bill is actually say. But in reality, is it doesn't happen that way. So I think re-examining it is, is a good thing. But I would agree with you in the, in the sense that I wouldn't want it to be diluted any, but I would actually like to see it strengthened. Um, so um, what, I, what I don't understand is how the Scottish government will have a role in that, if any. Uh, or is it going to be directly through our MPs? Uh, or do you believe that you have a role uh, in which you can influence the government? But, well, we do have a role, and not only do we have a role, we have a duty to speak out. So I think any parliamentarian of any government, if they feel strongly about, you know, of any institution, if they feel strongly about issues, and human rights, in many ways, no, no borders. They are, uh, it's part of, that's the whole point about that humanitarian aspect. Mm. Um, and I think there are, although in terms of jurisdiction and laws, etc., the, the borders are national, the concept of human rights is absolutely, by essence, uh, international. I think there's different ways that we can look at this. In terms of our influence um, and what we can actually do, obviously you as a committee have got roles and you've uh, uh, liaised with UK institutions and, and, and government, the government itself. We will do that um, internally within our government-to-government -government discussions with the UK. But we can also do that directly and have done in relation to um, the, the European uh, Union. Now, you, I'm talking about how we're going to refresh our action plan. We've got the four pillars. Now, one of those pillars was justice and, and, and home affairs. Clearly, the points that Hanzala have, has raised are the areas that are, you know, have traditionally been within those, that, that ambit in terms of uh, human rights, uh, immigration, etc. But I think in terms of the agenda going forward for ourselves, the UK and the European Union, we have to look at the interplay between immigration, human rights and indeed external affairs and security and stability in the world. Um, too much of the immigration agenda within the UK has been about within very inward looking um, and for some parties in the UK playing to prejudices. Um, some of the immigration issues are within the within Europe, and if we just concentrate on the issues within Europe, because obviously that's in terms of borders, whether it's Schengen um, or indeed the common travel area of, of um, the UK and Ireland, there's practicalities within that. But in Europe also have to think about the wider, that's what I said in my opening remarks, about the wider issue of of the issues of people coming to Europe as a continent and the implications of the instability for whatever, whether it's environmental in, in, uh, instability through climate change, which impacting on the southern borders considerably, you know, military conflict, which we're seeing extensively. All these things will take a long-term strategic um, uh, uh, requirement and the you know the European Union is finding its feet I think and still uh, I think I, I don't know, maybe, maybe refresh that rather than finding its feet has now established in terms of the European Affairs Service its role and responsibilities but one of the challenges and it will be for the Italian presidency in setting out that framework and for the commission going forward is the interplay between all of these because in terms of the issues if we don't if we you know, if we don't address some of the issues about north-south movement or about energy or security or indeed about climate change, then you know, we, we can't just have an immediate short-term impact. Climate change, again, again, thinking how we get into some of these issues, climate change is one where Scotland has built up a reputation, has expertise, is, is assisting. But if you think about you know, the Environment Committee, and I don't know who your rap European rapporteur is on the Environment um, Committee, um, but in relation to what's likely to happen to, you know, uh, if, if we don't tackle climate change, what's likely to happen in terms of the movement of people who will become environmental refugees as opposed to the economic you know, refugees that we're having just now, that's a long-term, that's a big long-term issue for us. We've also got to consider Europe as uh, an ageing continent. Uh, most of Europe is ageing. Italy is probably a, a kind of different example. Within, uh, it's got a very young population, but the vast majority of Europe is an ageing population. What does that mean in terms of having you know, people of working age that can contribute in terms of tax and, and where will they come from and what does that look like? So there is a kind of point about the, the you know, all the interplay in this wider agenda between you know the uh, you know the external affairs and, and GHA. My concern is 
that um, you know, although there's some you know, progress, um, and it was good to see the um, the joint agreement on visas, for example, between the Irish government and the UK government um, earlier, I think last week. The, the UK's um, opportunity to influence any of this, its credibility will be diminished if it doesn't be, if, if it can't, um, if it ends up being reactionary in terms of its immigration policy as opposed to long term and strategic, um, and in terms of um, uh, human rights and the interplay between that. So its voice of authority is diminished, not just the practical policies that it might influence. Um, and therefore, you know, I think that in terms of our role, that we shouldn't be bystanders in this. We shouldn't say just because, you know, been, we've had a referendum and the result was no, we should we should somehow, you know, you retreat into a box of um, yeah, limited devolution. You know, we've already established a base camp of our influence, both in climate change. Um, the fact we've got a separate justice system means that we already have direct links in relation to GHA issues. Um, and this committee has built up a reputation, at least the conveners, her work on issues around you know, whether it's in trafficking or human rights or that wider agenda. So I think we have a, a, a you know, we have a um, we have an authority within our devolved competencies because of justice, climate change, and indeed the economic environmental impact of humanitarian issues. But also we've got an authority that we're building up from experience and expertise, and, and I think we should do that. And if that means of being a voice of conscience within the UK, we can do that. But I hope that we can we can use that to, to influence the EU and its developments as well. And there shouldn't be a limit on our ambitions, but we should be targeted about where we can influence and why, not expect to replicate what the, the whole services of the UK, but there are clear areas and gender areas, where, whether it's through you know, justice, home affairs, our separate uh, legal system, whether it's through climate change, or indeed whether it's about the strategic thinking about where the economic wealth and stability and environmental security and energy security of the continent of Europe will be. That means that we have to think like Europeans. I think the Scots do think like Europeans, more so perhaps than, than elsewhere, but um, you know, we have to take on that obligation. And that's not just my obligation, that's one for the Parliament and the committee itself. Sorry, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a very brief follow-up from that. I mean, we see what's happening in R Ukraine. It's, it's in part of Europe. We see what's happening in Turkey just now, which is a part of Europe, although not part of the U European Union. But they have aspirations for joining the European Union, and they've been trying to address some of the human rights issues within their own borders. What are the main thrusts? What, what, what is the thrust of... Um, your concerns uh, in terms of change. What do you think that's going to change that is going to be detrimental to our high standards that we hold? I mean, we're renowned internationally for being a very fair and a very democratic nation. What do you think there is a danger of losing? Uh, well, well it's, it's, it's the authority to, to encourage um, other countries to, to behave in a way that's compliant with human rights. How on earth can you lecture other countries? And I'm not sure lecturing is the way to, to, to influence, but you know, try and encourage them to, to take a position when you're walking away from, from you walking away from, from human rights. And I think the issue of Turkey is very strong. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the opportunities from Turkey are very strategic in lots of different reasons, not just geopolitically in terms of the, the current situation, but also in terms of the... If you look at the economic growth rates that uh, Turkey's experienced recently, very extensive. There are a lot of interests, common interests, in terms of business between uh, Turkey and Scotland, not least in uh, whether it's in investments and financial services or indeed other areas. And um, you know, we've seen the success of Turkish Airlines uh, at, uh, uh, you know, in terms of Edinburgh Airport in particular. The, there's, the, the uh, Turkish government have opened up a consulate here in terms of encouraging uh, businesses. But we also know in terms of the accession process and their application and their, and their desire to be uh, part of the European Union, there are a number of hurdles that they only go through. And one of the recurring issues is on human rights. And I often, you know, I, 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 in fact, I know from the parliament, I, I met the Turkish president when he arrived, I think it was last summer, um, for meetings um, with the Turkish community and uh, interests here, you know, people are saying, oh, we'll always ask, and do you re raise the issue of human rights? Frequently in this parliament, people, you know, opposition members are, are, are on that agenda. The moral authority to be able to, to, to try and influence um, good practice on on human rights issue for whether it's Turkey or elsewhere becomes diminished if you yourself as a, a, a state which the UK is walks away from that now you know I think in terms of, of Turkey I mean I, I, I've been involved very early on 
in my ministerial um, responsibilities in this area for uh, helping finance and pay for um, you know trade unionists, uh, business people, the third sector from from Turkey coming to, to coming to understand better the European institutions and how they can develop and move forward. I, I, and I'm very positive with that agenda. But you know, along with you know, along with rights become responsibilities, and human rights is also a responsibility. And that's where the context of this should not just be seen in narrow case law for individual issues because some of the issues and again it's your better place to speak to the minister for for legal affairs in this on this area some of the case cases the high profile cases that the uk cite in terms of the overall percentage of of issues um is very small indeed so therefore you know playing politics with human rights on a short-term basis could have serious long-term consequences um for for uh, the uk and its influence across the world that's the bottom line thank you Okay, Claire Adamson. Um, thank you. It's just a, a, a supplementary in that area, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, talked a lot about immigration, um, but one of the challenges Scotland also faces is emigration and our falling population. And given that following the referendum, we are where we are with um, uh, different challenges across the UK, how, how will you be um, addressing this issue? And I, I was particularly struck during the referendum campaign, anecdotally, albeit that um, there was a perception that somehow Scotland was full up, and I don't think our population fully understands some of the challenges that a falling population could bring in the mm -hmm. future. Well, if you look at the government's economic strategy, it has a number of different strands, productivity, uh, participation in, in the workplace, uh, one, for example. But the other is population and making sure that we've got sufficient people, you know, sufficient numbers of working-age population to be able to pay for taxes and so that, you know, when I eventually get to my Zimmer, somebody can play for my health care and all the rest of it. Uh, and that's a very important point. You know, it's working age uh, population contributing and some of the myths that, that go about in terms of um, uh, you know, immigration, you know, particularly from, from Europe in terms of the studies that have been done, the net contribution that you know, migrants make to this country in terms of the contribution in taxes uh, to, to, to our country is, is quite considerable. And I think we need to surface that more in terms of information. But there's two ways of tackling that. One is to make sure that you have you know, good quality jobs and services so that the young people of Scotland can remain here if they choose but it is quite significant that um, you know it's 37,000 of the I think it's about 70 I'll correct the numbers if I've, I've got them wrong of um, the um, of the emigrants from Scotland, from Scotland are under 30. Now, that's great opportunity, you know, fine, but not because they have to leave. So part of it is addressing your working age population by making sure you're keeping your brightest and your best. But there's other ways of doing it. One, also the post-study work visa for the brightest and best of the world that are coming here. Now, remember the interplay of, of policies. You know, we've, we've, we've pursued, and I was, uh, you know, I'm very proud to have I've been the minister that took through the abolition of tuition fees legislation. Um, you know, what does that mean? You know, not only have I understood we've managed to save a billion pounds from Scottish students. Yes, but the consequences of that is we've attracted students from elsewhere. Now, that has potentially been a cost, but also the investment that the Scottish Government has given to our universities has made sure that they, um, they have maintained their, their investment levels so that that hasn't been to detriment to them. But every, for every international student that comes here, you know, their mums and dads or whatever, the visitors that come will spend money while they're here. There's an economic benefit to international students. But also there's an issue about the brightest and best getting the brightest and best to stay here. So in relation to immigration, you know, the, the issue, could we within the Smith Commission, a part of the proposal, look at what we can do in that area, for example, um, which had previously happened, that you know, idea of differentiated competitive edge happened under Jack McConnell and the, the last you know, Labour executive, Labour, Liberal Democrat executive. So we need to think about it in those contexts. In terms of, for, of the wider movement, you know, as I said, this should be seen within the context of Europe as a whole. I mean, Europe's got great strengths, but you know, if, we doesn't, if, if it's not dynamic in its economic growth, of which population is one of them, um, that's going to be a, a real challenge to us. So uh, we, we need to think about it, you know, about it in those terms as to what that means. And you know, if that means that you know, Scotland requires to go from 22,000 to 24,000 to make sure that we have a maintained working age population contribution, you can either do that by 
recalibrating the two, 2,000 of those that leave or identify 2,000 that might come um, on an annual basis to, 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 you know, to help, help our economy. But it's also in the key sectors, you know, energy, life sciences, um, you know, key new sectors for the world not uh, where we can be leading edge. And that's where the, that relationship between attracting the brightest and the best, keeping them here for those industries, for example, is going to be really important and how we therefore become more attractive in, in relation um, to that. So it's the, all, it's the interplay of all these issues. The other area I'm interested in developing is looking at kind of diaspora policy, both outward and inward. Um, I was very interested that Jimmy Dillon, who's the uh, who was a previous culture minister in Ireland, has now been appointed as a, a specifically tasked diaspora minister within the Taoiseach's office. Um, so um, well, I'm very keen to, to learn more about what they do. So obviously there's something about mobilising your interests externally across the world. But it, I'm also very conscious, and I met the Ukrainian um, community just yesterday morning about what that means in terms of whether it's the Polish community, the Ukrainian, or other strong communities that are within Scotland, how we work with them as well. Not just the different waves of historic immigration, but also the current um, the, the current talent that's coming to Scotland with the new the new Europeans. Can I ask a, okay, another idea? Can we move on to another area? It kind of leads me into to the, the other question that I, I wanted to ask this morning, Cabinet Secretary, and it, it's in relation particularly to the other side of your portfolio and culture. And we had a very successful international culture summer here in the summer, um, where um, the, the topic um, discussed, the theme of the, the conference was culture as a currency of trust. And you note that the research and creativity is one of the four um, priority areas. I was just wondering if you could give us a bit of insight about how, how arts and humanities will take part in that process and what benefits that bring to Scotland. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very keen in looking at the, the funding streams to look at Creative Europe in particular um, and the opportunities there. The digital um, aspects are very important. That's why in terms of our Nordic Baltic um, policy statement and my recent visits, particularly in relation to working with some of the Nordic countries, what we can do there. There's a read over that in relation to film as well. A lot of um, film production is co-production and in terms of how we can then stimulate that market as well and in terms of jobs and services it's an area of, of expertise we can try and work with different countries so I'm, I'm very keen to to progress that and part of my discussions with other countries are are on that um, I think it's quite interesting about I hadn't realized this but apparently Scotland um, is the second to France in and the number in, in terms of the att cinema attendance per head of population um, and actually, probably, we're not as well served by cinemas in lots of parts of Scotland. And what's interesting is using digital technology of what you can do. And I was recently up at Thurso, at the community cinema that's there. And they've been using digital... Of course, digital streaming means that you can get the best of culture from whether I mean, it could be Paris or Berlin, but it could also be from Edinburgh, Scotland, or Thurso, beaming out into other areas. And they were talking about the reach and range. And uh, some countries, particularly Nordic countries, when you've... What, it's not just health services for rural, remote areas. It's also about the right for... Your entertainment and uh, also the, that cultural life, which is so important. So there's something interesting about trying to, to be, be, you know, in, in, in that in that area that I'm, I'm looking into what we can do. I can't give you, you know, um, definite plans just now, but I think there's a great opportunity because we've got areas of expertise. Um, one of the things that, particularly in terms of a number of countries, you know, particularly Baltic countries, Lithuania is, is a good one, are very interested in our creative industries and how we promote. You know, how we use that and that's an area that the UK have been quite happy for me to lead on on behalf of the UK because of our experience in this area it's going back to the representation that we have where we've got areas of uh, expertise and experience whether it's creative industries whether it's fishing um, whether it's climate change these are key areas where actually you know we've got strengths and you know within the constitutional settlement we should be able to lead on behalf of not just Scotland but the rest of the rest of the UK and I think digital is one of them our gaming industry you know as you know is very very strong indeed and the growing interplay between gaming and film in the digital world um, has great opportunities and bearing in mind if you go back to linking up all the policies if we were trying to internationalize um, our export base for our SMEs that's going to require the platform that everything will be able to operate on a digital basis in terms of promotion internationally exporting and therefore growing a cadre of 
um, you know, digitally literate uh, students that can then influence exporting opportunities, for example. So these are all these, these areas are all connected. Um, uh, but I'm particularly interested in, in that area. And the Culture Summit with 25 countries, not, not all governments represented there, not all from Europe by any means, because we wanted to make sure it was wider, uh, wider than that over the six continents, I think is a very good platform for our reputation um, and the experience and that exchange. And already, as a result of the Culture Summit, we're engaging in some of these issues, uh, particularly with Baltic countries. Thank you. Thank you. Alec Rowley. Could I raise a couple of issues, but the first one being you talked about exports, and one of the things I'm hoping that this committee will look at is transport links with Europe mm -hmm. and, and further afield. Um, but specifically, in my own constituency, um, we have the port of Forsyth, and currently there is, there is one ferry operating for there, I think a company, EDR, operate that ferry, and it's a freight ferry, a passenger uh -huh. ferry, yeah. that takes off. But there is an issue there right now with the European Sulphur Emissions Directive. Um, and that company, and I know that the Chief Executive for Fourth Ports has written to Alex Salmond, mm -hmm. and I'm in the process of, of writing to John Swinney, um, because that company are basically saying that as a result of the sulphur emissions and the ferry not having the standards that's required, they, they are basically saying that they think they may have to pull that route completely and pull the ferry. And I'm wondering, are you aware of that? And obviously but, the consequences of that is that we have lorries running south to ports like Hull, etc. And what are we actually doing to look at that issue specifically, but to look at how we actually get our ports more in use so that we can actually have companies get an easier access to markets in Europe and elsewhere? Uh, I, I am aware of the issue. I know the government is taking these issues very seriously, and I, but I'm not in the position because I'm neither the transport or economic um, Enterprise Minister be able to give you a, a, an immediate response at, at this stage. I think the responsibility we all have, and and, and you as a local member and as, ourselves as, as government, is not to um, unnecessarily cause fear and concern. What we need to do is resolve the issues where we can. So what I can tell you is that um, the Scottish Government is aware of the issue and will seek to resolve whatever it can within its powers to try and... Uh, I think, address what the issue is. Uh, but I'm not going to give you any detail. I can't, I'm not in the position to give you any detail, but your, your question was, am I aware of it? And the answer is yes. Um, is, it, is it being taken seriously? The answer is yes. Um, will there be positive resolution? Well, I hope we can all work together collectively to make sure there is. OK. And, I mean, more broadly, as I said, I hope the, the, this committee starts to look at the wider issue of transport yeah, rights and yeah. what we're doing. Could also, you, you talked about the importance of youth employment. Um, and, and I do wonder what models we have across Europe, because one of the successes yeah. of Scotland in terms of where we're at with youth employment, even though youth unemployment is still at unacceptable levels, one of the major successes, I would argue, is the role played by local government. And that's not very often actually mentioned when, when ministers like yourself and others um, talk about the success of youth employment. If you take, again, my own constituency in Fife, Fife Council has diverted something like nine million over the last two years into apprenticeships. And to date, they have a success rate of over a thousand youngsters being placed in apprenticeships with private companies. And I do wonder, is there models across Europe? Because while we, 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 we tend to have the rhetoric in this country about talking about localism, we tend to ignore the fact that the important role that local government is mm -hmm. actually playing. I know councils across Scotland have really good projects and are, 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 are very successful in engaging young people in training and skills. Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at that in terms of Scotland? And have, is, there, is there European models there where actually local government and regional government are, are, are playing a major role mm -hmm. in terms of tackling these issues? Uh, well, I can see that Angela Constance, as the Cabinet Secretary for, for Youth Employment, has been very active in terms of looking and learning from uh, different countries. I know she's been in Germany and Switzerland and in, indeed some of the Scandinavian countries in looking at their models. So we are always looking for different models and how they can work. And obviously the Wood Commission, part of the Wood Commission's work, I think, was looking at that kind of what can we learn from elsewhere. In terms of your point, and again, it's the interplay of different areas, I can actually, you know, from, from my own experience as a minister, um, relate to the role of the different tiers of government. So, for example, and, and it has a European dimension. So, you know, I was um, the, the minister that managed to secure the funding for 25,000 
modern apprenticeships when I was the education secretary. Um, because one of the things we wanted to do that, at that period, it was kind of the 8-9 period, was the recession meant that we knew there would be a big impact on those, on, on those areas. I also was very conscious that in terms of the... Um, I, I specifically pursued the league table in relation to uh, councils in terms of those um, councils that had the lowest levels or sorry, uh, I would say, I would say the, the highest levels of young people not in education, employment and training and focus specifically on the bottom five to move them. Now, some of that, and, and that meant learning from some that were better, for example. Um, I also remember meeting, uh, going to Fife um, to look at some of the, the examples of what was done. And the, what was quite clear in that relation, and I think you should probably get an update from the current Youth Employment Minister as what was done at that time, uh, or what she's currently doing, because obviously things have moved on significantly even since then. But one of the things we did was we, we brought forward European structural funding as much as we could. Now, you know the government did that for capital to make sure that we could plug the gap of what was happening in the private sector by ensuring that we were front-loading as much of capital investment as we could as a government in that period. But one of the things you might not be aware of, I also did that for using European structural funds to ensure that we could um, tackle the issue of young people so that we didn't go back to the 1980s where you know people you, you had a you know you had a you know an economic uh, downturn that caused the impact for generations and one of the areas of doing that is to work the interplay between skills agencies local government and other and, and in each local authorities you tend to have a different calibration of the relationship between all the different agencies bringing them to work better together was really important but also recognising those local authorities that kept modern apprenticeships and I know West Lothian where I represent was one of the few that did actually keep them because some of them some local authorities had moved away from that so I think best practice whether it's international or best practice locally is really important but use of European funding for young people is one thing that we feel very strongly about so therefore in the last you know, when I've been representing our interests in with the, the UK in relation to some of the funding issues, making sure that youth employment, particularly, and our flexibility to play to local strengths, because it's not all one size fits all, even within Scotland, making sure we have flexibility within the funding streams to be able to tackle youth employment, but to do so by following what works well in different areas, whether it's Fife or Ayrshire or West Lothian, is really, really important. So my, my experience is obviously a bit dated uh, because it was a, a previous point, but I'm sure that's an issue if you're interested in that. Obviously, connectivity, you can, you, you no doubt want to hear from the Transport Minister, but also in terms of youth employment, how your agenda and looking and learning from elsewhere um, is being done by the current uh, Cabinet Secretary for, for Youth Employment, I think will be very helpful. And she also then may be able to give you an idea of what European funding is being used, used at what local level and how we can play to the strengths of where local authorities are doing things well and how other local authorities can learn from the best practice that we see in, in some areas. But I, I absolutely recognise your point. OK, thanks. Could I just very quickly, a final point. In terms of Europe... I mean, the general view, we've all been spending a lot of time on doorsteps recently, the, the general view there is it's remote, it's yeah. over-bureaucratic, um, people that are involved in it are on a bit of a, a jolly, it's costly. I mean, there is not that sort of good sort of perception of, of, of what Europe actually does. How do we change that, given that we feel Europe is so important for Scotland? Uh, I think I think you've got to you've got to get back to basics, and it's it's jobs, services, um, and it's about wages. And you know, one of the challenges we've got in Europe is the austerity measures, which by and large across Europe quite often are blamed by everybody on Brussels. Um, that you know the, the move to have a growth agenda. You know, we've got to have some kind of growth agenda, and people are sharing in that growth, and that means stimulating demand. And, and one of the ways of doing that is to make sure enough you know people have got sufficient wages to be able to buy goods and services from within Europe to help stimulate that, that growth. I think that's a kind of basic economic argument. One, I think, it's a very good point to, to make to the, um, um, the ambassador, who obviously you'll be discussing um, this issue with uh, after me. I think I absolutely firmly believe that the the most pro-European uh, part of the population are young people because they see things as jobs and opportunities when they can. But that can't just be at university level or Erasmus. It's got to be in other areas as well. Um, and it's also about driving up wages. So therefore, the issue that we've debated at length in this parliament about the fact we don't have powers over the minimum wage, so that makes it difficult then to in, uh, you insist in contracts about the living wage, we are pursuing that actively with the European Commission. But a basic thing like that that affects people's lives, I think all of us on all sides of the referendum will, have, will, will identify the way to get people interested in, in 
politics, whether it's European or Scottish, has to be about things that affect in their lives. Environment affects them hugely. People feel strongly about environmental issues, but jobs and services and, 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 and issues around um, you know, protecting hard for rights. And I think, in, going back to the issue about an in-out referendum, I'm sure across the political divide will agree that one of the best things that's come out of Europe is the protection of employment rights for many, many people. And reminding people that that's something that they have and they wouldn't want to lose will be very much part of... Of that. So I think it's about bread and butter, it's practical issues, it's relating to how things impact on the ground and we shouldn't just rely on you know, our MEPs to be our, you know, to talk about Europeans and be Europeans, we all have a responsibility to communicate that. It's not just me as the external affairs cabinet secretary, it's everybody, but it's a huge, I mean, you know, you can there are conferences just on that subject, Alex. <laughs> so I'm not going to be you, but you know, brass tacks basically, I think is where we need to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Cabinet good morning. Secretary. I wonder if I could just pick up the theme on youth employment that was mentioned by Alec Rowley there. You, you mentioned in your, your opening presentation that Scotland has the only youth employment minister, I think, in, in Europe, and that we do appear to be bucking the trend in terms of the figures and statistics. I, I noticed from the, the Brussels Bulletin this morning that in Europe they've still got 23% of young job seekers, seekers age 15 to 24 couldn't find a job in January 2014. I think that's about 4 million uh, youngsters in that age bracket. Um, do you see much interest from, from Europe in what Scotland's done in, in appointing the dedicated minister and what kind of lessons can we... Can we learn? Um, yes, there, yes, there is, and um, and as I said, Andrew Constance has been active in this agenda and and working on workshops and different things that have been established by the European Commission on these on these agenda areas. I mean, our unemployment is not a, a, you know we've still got big challenges, a long way to go. Um, and your what, the figure you quoted is average. In some countries, it is much much worse. Okay. And you, know, so therefore, again, strategically, you know, you cannot have a. We saw what happened to the youth of Scotland in the 1980s, that have now probably the grandparents that have never known work because of what happened in the 1980s, and the dislocation that that can have, and the health consequences and all the rest of it. So the real kind of strategic issue about stability and security across Europe is there are some countries where that level of youth unemployment is not just bad for the individuals, they could actually have, you know, the long-term implications for that are, are extensive, but also some of the short-term kind of anxieties or, you know, what could happen in societies where you've got that, where people feel so distant, removed, um, and and, and, and they're in, uh, if you're unemployed, a young person unemployed in Spain or or Italy, you know, how, how are you going to feel to the, the authority of power, et cetera, and, you know, stability? If we believe that, um, you know, uh, cohesive societies are essential for economic growth, which I think that's probably an economic consensus within Scotland, those societies that don't have that cohesion and have huge levels of youth unemployment, that, that's, a, that's a danger for, for them in, in many, many ways. So the, those lessons have must be learned. I'm, I'm convinced the, um, the Italian presidency will take youth employment very seriously. I think the, the Commission should. I, I think it's interesting in terms of how um, John claude Juncker's establishment of the Commission of Portfolios, although there's movement and change, some of it retrenches some of the, or inherits some of the, and probably for understandable reasons, inherits um, the the previous um, administration. I do think that, you know, the committee that I tend to deal with is youth culture and sport, and it covers lots of different areas. The idea of, of Europe having a dedicated commissioner for, for youth, I think, is, is, is very strong, but, you know, unfortunately, my, my, my influence and power on, 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 on setting out the structure of the commission might be limited. But, you know, if, if youth, are both, youth are both an opportunity for in terms of the European argument, in many ways for the mobility opportunities, the best of Europe can be benefited by young people. But not all young people. Um, and I think that's the challenge, is that there's two sides to this. Is how, does Europe, how, do, how does Europe collectively deal with what happens with young people? And the Youth Employment Guarantee, which we already meet in many ways because in terms of our policy, but the idea of that being a really important part of the political signal of how Europe is taking young people seriously. How can young people take... Going back to Alex's point, how can young people take Europe seriously if Europe doesn't take young people seriously? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a virtuous circle. And so, therefore, you know, we're very strong in arguing that the UK government should accept and, and, and support the youth um, employment guarantee 
not just obviously in practice, which we by and large do, and, and therefore our strengths tend to be on employment. Uh, we've got far, although our unemployment figures compared to, to, to UK currently are fairly comparative, where we're stronger is on um, positive destinations, so, so that after a period in a, a training or other areas, we've got far better levels of sustained um, employment, and particularly for those leaving school, the rates now, you know, to say the, the rates of young people that have got positive destinations are better now than they, than, than, than you know, having gone through this period of, of recession and downturn than they were in 2006-07 is quite remarkable. That's a, that's a great achievement. But we still have more to do, so you know, we need to learn the lessons. So th there's two aspects to it. Is it's the moral authority going back that you can, you know, if you if you talk the talk, not just you know, walk the walk and all the rest of it, you can actually you do both sides of it. You deliver um, uh, not just in what you say but what you do. That's a strong argument. So again, that's an area where we've got responsibility for it. It's not reserved. People are interested in what we do and can learn from it. And going back to Alec Riley's point, we should learn fr from others as well. So I think you know we need to be quite targeted in the areas of our intervention. But youth, you know, the youth employment agenda, I think, is one of the biggest, not just facing this country or indeed uh, the United Kingdom as a state, but also also Europe very much. So I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, I, mean, I think a, a European Commissioner for Youth Employment would be a fantastic step forward. Of, I think we're behind the curve on that one. <laughs> 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 I think it's a done. Have I got time for one? Very quickly, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you mentioned the, the kind of over overlap with Italy in terms of some of the, the key areas that we, we like to focus on, and um, the digital single market is one that is of interest to me mm -hmm. and, and the committee, and also I see in the Italian programme for, for work in the next six months. Uh, do you see any further progress being made in European mobile tele telephone charges in that kind of issue? I, I know Europe made some progress recently in flattening out um, roaming charges. But we all know that as soon as you walk into another jurisdiction with your mobile phone, you tend to put it in the drawer and use it when you come, when you come back home. Do you, do you see any work there to actually establish a real single market in terms of charging? for mobile communications throughout the European Union? Well, it's one that we're very keen to ensure you know, happens. And I think it's quite interesting that in the themes that you're looking at in, in terms of subjects when you're planning your, your activities, um, you know, transport as connectivity is a very important part um, of um, improving the economic outlook for Scottish firms and their engagement, but so is digital as connectivity, and it needs to be seen in the same light as, as, as transport and so the value it adds to um, you know, connections for economic growth activity, and also about communication. I mean, if you think about it in the, in the wider sense, um, and it's about how Europe sells itself to young people and vice versa, is you know, we've seen sort of growth in social media in terms of political engagement ourselves through our referendum experience. Obviously, that's happening on a global scale with different kind of international connections. So there's, there's opportunity, there's political opportunity, but there's also economic opportunity from this. In terms of the practicality of, the, of, of where we are in relation to the development of the single market, I know it's a, a priority for uh, John claude Juncker himself. I know he knows that this is a, a key area of, of um, development and progress, and indeed we recognise that in, in, in terms of our communication with the, the incoming commission as an area that we, as a jurisdiction, is very keen, are keen to progress. In terms of providing you with an update, I'm probably better just to come back to you, um, what, having consulted with my colleagues in the Enterprise uh, Division, to give you a, a better kind of assessment of where we are with this and what's likely. But I know it's a key area that you're, inter you're interested in, and I'm sure you'll pursue it um, with the Econ Economy Committee. I think it's a good area in terms of how... The, your committee works across parliament with your rapporteurs to, to work with the economy uh, committee on the theme of connectivity, both digital and indeed traditional transport. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roger Campbell. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, before you go, cabinet secretary, in the absence of Jamie McGregor, I thought uh, I'd, better, <coughs> I'd better ask you a question about marine environment and fisheries, and in terms of really. Uh, 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 kind of your involvement and what you foresee personally as your involvement going forward in, in this area on behalf of the government? Um, I mean, clearly it's an area that we've got expertise on. Um, indeed, there was some uh, recent uh, successful completion of, I think it was the Marine Spatial Planning uh, Directive, which we had direct involvement in. So, again, it's an area of expertise. If you look at previous comments that we've had um, to previous presidencies, mar the marine area is one of the key areas. Uh, it's an area particularly in relation to our work with Ireland and, and accessing some of the, 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 the funding streams 
um, from Europe. Uh, we're working very well with them. And we've just uh, seconded an official to the Commission um, as well. And I think it's in this area on the fishing... Um, the fishing man fisheries management. So um, it's not just what we do in terms of um, our representation. We also want to make sure that you know our expertise is used within the commission, and the more that the, that's that's done, the better. So I think that's a very that's one of the areas that we've we've, we've looked at. Um, obviously, Richard Lockhead has worked very you know very extensively in this area. I think it's quite interesting. He said to me, and I'm not. In fact, he will now be the. I suspect the the. The, the fisheries minister across Europe with the longest experience because the previous one was Swedish and obviously Sweden have just got a new government. So he used to say, to, Richard was saying to me that in terms of um, ministers, I mean, he has been seven years as a fisheries minister. There will be nobody with as much expertise and obviously in terms of the geographic responsibility, the amount of, of waters and, and fish, fisheries interests that we have. So you know, it's one area that I, I, I think the case is so strong um, that with that area of expertise, speaking um, on to an agreed pre-prepared line with the UK, across the UK, that uh, I would expect Richard Loghead to be leading the UK delegations um, going into much of the fisheries discussion. But in, in terms of um, Jamie's interest in its, you know, food, drink, agriculture and marine, we're very conscious that these are areas of competitive strengths. Um, we have taken a very active interest, um, uh, certainly in terms of uh, a ministerial um, uh, engagement and going back to my very first point about refreshing the action plan which is what I know um, the committee is interested in as well we'll make sure that those areas of competitive advantage interest and expertise are very much surfaced in that action plan for, so that you as a committee can scrutinize um, our activities perhaps more easily than I've been able in the past thank you thank you um, Hans Ella. Uh, thank you Jim. Um, I just wanted to uh, revisit the, the the transport element of things and there's some very positive things happening in Scotland in terms of our uh, air links uh, across mm -hmm. the world. Uh, we've got the Turkish Airlines, uh, we've got Amrats, and we've got uh, Qatar Airlines. And we used to have uh, PAA, Pakistan International Airlines. And uh, I know that the, the Pakistan community in Glasgow are particularly working to re-establish that link. What I'm hoping to ask yourself is, how can we actually take full uh, value from these links in terms of our trade to these countries? Mm -hmm. uh, are we actually um, holding some sort of um, database that actually demonstrates what our experts are, exports are to these countries due to those links, um, other than just tourism? Um, um, and if we don't have, could we possibly have a look at that to see uh, how we can best use those links? For uh, we, we absolutely do, and every arm of government is active in pursuing connectivity and improved connectivity. So whether it's Visit Scotland for, for tourism, and I noticed Mike Cantley was just announcing another Canadian link. Um, delighted to see the extensive links in the US, Philadelphia now, for example. Um, hugely important Chicago, uh, part of my previous Scotland Week um, visits to Chicago, I met with the airlines. So I've met with uh, my deputy, Hamza Youssef, as you know, has been very extensively involved in some of the, the developments, particularly in the Gulf states, in terms of connectivity and promotion. So every arm of government um, has at some point been involved in this. It's very coordinated. SCI and indeed Scottish Enterprise, I'm sure, will be able to furnish you with the information they have. But I thought it was quite interesting, in uh, particularly um, talking to Edinburgh Airport and Turkey, Airlines about their experience with, with Edinburgh was the initial thought that a lot of the traffic uh, would be obviously of tourism uh, both both ways but actually the bit they were pleasantly surprised by the, the business opportunities that came from that now that's uh, a great for for that uh, those air, air links and those lines and those um, paths just now but that's also a good story to encourage others um, so it's not just about you know individually it's how we work collectively say look we are good for business um, it's a great opportunity. Um, so it's an area that I think you know, if you take an active involvement as a committee as well, that connectivity we can. But I, I, you know, it's probably easiest if you um, in developing your work stream in relation to connectivity is to identify with SDI and, and Scottish Enterprise the figures that are there. But I, I'm hugely optimistic. I'm also very pleased with progress to date. But to reassure you that you know, both Hamza Yusuf and myself have been 
know, active in, in, in this area, as well as the, the transport environment um, and uh, so the transport minister and the enterprise ministers as well. So a great opportunity. And you might want to look at the segmented way or integrated between tourism and mm. business. Mm. But by and large, it's quite interesting, the interplay between, because it's outward bound and inward bound. Mm. Um, but, you know, that's the point. If you're wanting to encourage your um, SMEs to become more international, you know, international and export focused, we have to then help facilitate the opportunities they have to do business, whether it's digital connectivity, whether it's skills and talent of young people, um, to, to help support them digitally or indeed um, through languages or you know, is it in terms of connectivity through flights and all those areas are absolutely critical for the success of Scotland. Uh, but I'm optimistic but there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done in that area. Thank you very much. And maybe just a, a quick update for the, the committee. I believe that there's a possibility that the Economy Committee are doing something on export, so we should communicate with them. Cabinet Secretary, I know we said we would finish at 10 past 10, and we've, we've obviously explored uh, lots of areas. Just one very quick um, a request I would make, a plea maybe for all of my colleagues, and maybe just not this committee, but all of the committees, is one of the issues we have with um, the Westminster Government is communications with MSPs. Um, we've always had a tough time with the Home Office, um, and that seems to be now ex extended to um, the Department of Work and Pensions. And I'm just hoping that the Scottish Government and all of its communications with the UK Government will be able to impress on them how important it is for MSPs to be able to go on and do their, their job. Uh, point uh, taken, uh, appreciated, understood, and uh, it's something I've done previously and will continue to do. Perhaps we should use the new opportunity uh, facing Scotland to, to get uh, a good respect agenda that allows everyone to go about Indeed. their business. Indeed. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I thank you very much on behalf of the committee for your evidence too this morning. We've explored many, many areas and um, given us lots of um, information that will inform our work programme um, for the, the coming months. Thank you very much. I'm going to briefly um, um, suspend committee for 10, you know, maybe eight minutes um, uh, for um, a quick comfort break and for us to uh, make sure that we welcome the ambassador appropriately. Thank Thanks. you.
And welcome back to the European External Relations Committee. Um, our uh, agenda item three this morning is um, with and to hear from His Ex Excellency Pasquale Terracciano, who is the Italian ambassador to the UK. Um, and we're going to discuss this morning the Italian um, presidency of the Council of the European Union. Can I welcome you very warmly, Ambassador? I know we um, had a reception last night and I hope, hopefully you had a very warm welcome last night. Can I also welcome the, the guests of the Ambassador and others this morning to our public gallery, including um, Graham Blythe, who's with us this morning, um, is the head of the European Commission office in Scotland, and Jackie Miner, who is, uh, as he puts it, his boss. <laughs> Um, uh, at the UK office. Um, Ambassador, I believe you have some uh, opening remarks and we would love to hear from you now. Thank you, Madam Convener, and good morning to all distinguished members of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I have some introductory remarks on the priorities of the Italian Presidency and on what we have achieved so far. Uh, while presenting the priorities of the Italian Presidency of the Council, Prime Minister Renzi stressed the Italian presidency is a unique opportunity to discover the true soul of Europe and the profound meaning of our life together. With this spirit, Italy has engaged enthusiastically in this uh, particular atypical presidency, which takes place against the background of a deep institutional change and at the beginning of a new legislative cycle. But despite the objective limits of this transitional phase, this is a key period to set the strategic priorities for the EU institutions for the next five years. The Italian presidency is acting as a catalyst for policy change to allow Europe to return to a path of sustainable growth and restore the citizens' confidence in the European project. We want to turn the present phase, the beginning of a new political cycle, into a fresh start for Europe. In the last three years, so all EU member states both those in and those out of the euro, have been focusing on assuring fiscal consolidation and deficit reduction. At national level, we have initiated important structural reforms in order to recuperate competitiveness. But this is not enough to address the deep malaise of our peoples who were dramatically affected by the recession and now fear for their future and the future of their children. It was such a malaise so as to result in the rise of Europhobic parties all over Europe at the last European elections. In fact, the motto of the Italian presidency is Europe, a fresh start. Our main aim is to create a better, stronger and more effective Europe. We have reasons to be confident. In June, the European Council started to address European citizens' concerns by agreeing a strategic agenda for the Union in times of change which has been presented by the new president of European Commission, Juncker. We consider this a very important achievement, both at political and institutional level. For the first time, the appointment of the new president of the Commission has been clearly linked to a number of strategic priorities agreed by member states. Just when the candidate to the top job of the Commission was selected on the basis of a process considered controversial by some member states, it was necessary to reaffirm the central role of the member states in designing the working agenda at EU level in order to facilitate a common and coherent organization of the work among the EU institutions. Now, to, I come to the priorities of the Italian presidency. There are basically three. A job-friendly Europe, delivering economic growth, moving Europe closer to its citizens, an area of democracy, rights and freedom, and stronger and global role for Europe in foreign policy. Now we are mid-term into our semester of presidency, and the time is ripe for a state of play, assessing what has been achieved so far in these three areas and what remains in the agenda for the next three months. Growth and jobs. With more than 26 million people unemployed in Europe, the Italian presidency is focusing on creating more jobs and fostering growth as the two main drivers of the EU economic policy, implementing the Youth Employment Initiative, relaunching the EU 2020 strategy, deepening and strengthening the EMU, 
boosting competitiveness in the EU, implementing the, digita the digital single market, promoting industrial renaissance, achieving a EU common position on climate energy package 2030. It should not come as a surprise that on almost every single topic I have just mentioned, today, more than ever, Italy and the UK share a similar approach, to the, a similar approach to the policies which are needed at EU level to deliver economic growth and jobs and to move Europe closer to its citizens. This is especially true for the need to fully exploit the potential of the single market in all its dimensions, including the market of products, the market of services, and the digital single market. Reduce unnecessary administrative burdens and cut red tape for SMEs. Support open and fair trade and strategic partnerships. Make progress in the economic monetary union while respecting the integrity of the single market and preserving transparency and openness towards non-EU EU countries. And promote climate and energy policy, i.e. affordable energy for companies and citizens, secure energy for our countries, green energy as an engine for growth. While recognizing that the specific concerns raised by the United Kingdom and related to the future development of the EU will need to be addressed, as stated at the European Council last June, the Italian presidency thinks that today the EU must be flexible enough to be able to support and to act as a multiplier of national government's efforts through effective European policies and investments. The UK is an essential and indispensable partner to achieve these goals. Given the decisive added value the UK has always provided in key moments in the life of the European Union. As recently stated by Prime Minister Matteo Renzi at the European Parliament, a Europe without the United Kingdom would, be, would not simply be a less rich Europe, it would be less Europe, less itself. Together we can work effectively to shape a better and smarter Europe, less intrusive and more efficient. <coughs> now, on progress achieved on growth and jobs, the Italian presidency is focusing all its efforts on tackling the scourge of youth unemployment, including through an effective implementation of the Youth Guarantee Scheme. Given the alarming high level of youth unemployment, the Italian presidency hosted yesterday a European summit in, in Milan on unemployment and growth as a follow-up to the summits previously held in Paris and Berlin. Following a clear European roadmap, the Italian Presidency is working in all Council formations in order to redirect the action of the EU to the strengthening of the real economy. Our objective, our objective is to boost competitiveness <clears throat> while tackling social exclusion and enhancing the social dimensions of the EMU. On these issues, the Presidency is promoting political debates within the sectorial councils with a view to a final report by the Presidency as contribution to the review of the EU 2020 strategy. The report will also address the need for closer links between the EU 2020 strategy and the European semester and for a be better balancing between real and financial economy. We are pressing to start the new legislative cycle with a clear strategic commitment to completing the single market. ICT and digital technologies are powerful tools to modernize our economies while creating highly qualified jobs. On uh, July 8th and 9th, Italy hosted high-level conference, Digital Venice, with the participation of important political and business leaders. This conference sent out the clear message that boosting competitiveness in Europe could be achieved only by developing the digital agenda, completing the digital single market and integrating it in the EU 2020 strategy. The Italian presidency is working hard on the political framework for climate and energy for 2030 in order to agree a EU common position at the October European Council. Now, moving the second objective, moving Europe closer to its citizens. The strategic agenda for EU underlines that the May 2014 European elections open a new legislative cycle. This moment of political renewal 
come pre comes precisely as our countries emerge from years of economic crisis and as public disenchantment with politics has grown. It is the right time to set out what we want the Union to focus on and how we want it to function. Italy entirely and wholeheartedly subscribes to these words and considers this second set of priorities as the core of our presidency. It may articulate as follows. A more effective mode of operating for the EU institutions, a common policy for immigration and asylum, a better management of the EU borders, strengthening European judicial cooperation, <clears throat> protection of fundamental human rights in Teralia, the principle of non-discrimination and gender equality. <clears throat> Our main objective is to minimize the perceived gap between European citizens and EU institutions in order to push for a better and more democratic Europe. The EU should be deeply rooted in the principles of attribution, subsidiarity and proportionality. As a consequence, it should be less intrusive in all the, those sectors that could be better dealt with at national, regional or local level. This is why, since August, the Italian Presidency has been promoting at the General Affairs Council a common reflection on how to effectively reform the working methods of the EU institutions within the Council. We are looking at issues like subsidiarity and proportionality principles, the relationship between euro ins and euro outs, the role of national parliaments, <coughs> how to assure the effective and complete implementation of European Council decisions, and a more des decisive push towards the simplification of EU rules. <coughs> now, coming to the rights, a stronger role of the EU in the Mediterranean is paramount in order to prevent new tragedies in the Mediterranean. Last July, the Justice and Home Affairs Informal Council recognized that more solidarity among EU member states is needed and that the borders of each member states are to be considered as a EU border. We have also appreciated the political endorsement to the start of a new joint maritime patrolling operation as of next November 1st, Triton operation, which will be led under the edges of a strengthened Frontex agency. As regards human rights and fundamental freedoms, non-discrimination and gender equality, the Italian presidency is at the forefront. In our view, all these principles represent the cornerstone of European construction. With this in mind, the Italian presidency has relaunched the negotiation on the scheme of directive on non-discrimination and important progress has been registered on the directive designed to improve the gender balance in Europe's company boardrooms. Furthermore, the Italian Presidency will host in Rome next October 23rd and 24th the conference on the Beijing Platform for Action of the World Conference on Women. And in November, Italy will inaugurate a week of rights to assess strate strategies targeting discrimination in Europe. Now, the third last priority, stronger and global role for Europe in foreign policy priorities. Italy is convinced that only a stronger position of the EU on the global stage may help us to get out the economic crisis. At the same time, economic growth has to be based on our <coughs> shared European values, thus becoming a new model at international level. Last July, the Informal Justice and Home Affairs Council provided a follow-up to the results of the Mediterranean Task Force and has stressed the key role of a closer integration between the external and the internal dimension of migratory policies by strengthening the dialogue with third countries of origin and transit of migrants. At the end of November, the Italian Presidency has scheduled three ministerial meetings devoted to migratory issues. The fourth Euro-African Ministerial Conference with the participation of Northwest African countries on migrations and development in the framework of the Rabat process. The joint conference of foreign and interior ministers. The first ministerial conference of the Khartoum process with Eastern Africa countries. All these events will highlight the key link between migrations and development as well as the key role of the relation between migration, security, and trafficking of human beings. 
Italy also encourages the regional dimension of the EU neighborhood policy and supports the so-called Amici Initiative, a Southern Mediterranean Investment Coordination Initiative, which aims at rationalizing European aid to the Southern regions. The Italian presidency strongly supports also the ongoing negotiations on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, since trade and investment, foreign investments are an integral part of our strategy for the external action. <coughs> As regards the comprehensive economic and trade agreement with Canada, the debates promoted during the Italian presidency have resulted in the conclusion of the negotiations in August and to the presentation of the agreement at the EU-Canada summit last September 25th. We also are finalizing partnership agreements with Western Africa countries. Italy full, fully supports the High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy for a constant and coherent commitment with the Asian Pacific partners on all global and regional challenges. In mid-October, the Euro-Asia region will be at the center of attention, not only at the ASEM Summit, <coughs> which will be hosted in Milan on 16 and 17 October, but also on the occasion of a number of other related events, business forums, civil society meetings, cultural events. This would be a unique opportunity to promote growth and development of the two regions and reinforce the dialogue on political and economic cooperation as well as social and cultural exchanges. And finally, let me just <coughs> mention uh, that we will host in Milan Expo 2015 from May 2015 to October 2015. We, the Italian presidency is now paying special attention to the issue of sustainable development. And during the formal councils of agriculture, the main focus was the issue of food security and the possible posit positive synergies with the Expos Milan Milano 2015, uh, whose theme will be feeding the planet energy for life. And this, Madame Convener, concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very comprehensive um, uh, work ongoing there. Can I just make the, uh, uh, reinforce the point that, that mobile phones shouldn't be used in the committee room because they interfere with broadcasting and, and I don't think they're broadcasting. People like the buzz in their ears when the phones are, are being used. If I could just um, impress on people to do that. Um, Ambassador, you, you mentioned many, many uh, priorities and, and, and focus here and um, one of the the, the focus that we have in Scotland is, is with youth unemployment, and I'm sure there's a number of my committee colleagues will, will go into that. But at the beginning of your um, contribution, you mentioned the meeting in Milan yesterday, um, and I was, we, we were looking to try and have an update on that, and we, we couldn't find anything concrete yet, but I don't know whether you're in a position to give this committee an update on uh, the purpose of the meeting yesterday and maybe some of the outcomes. Well, in the meeting, the, the purpose of the meeting was taking st stock of the progress in implementing the Youth Employment Initiative. Uh, it was not a real, it was not a summit, it was more a conference at high level, uh, because we don't yet have the, the final uh, data of the interim report, which is expected on the um, implementation of the Youth Employment Initiative. So, so it was a, a more... Um, theoretical, let's say, talks taking uh, of, of, of the experience so far gathered. Um, I think that there was some, um, in spite of the fact that was not, uh, uh, major decisions were not expected, some movement was registered. I would, an interesting movement, I would say, uh, because the, you know that the, uh, the Youth Employment Initiative was, um, launched front-loading uh, funds that had or already been allocated in uh, the budget for a total of six, bi uh, six billion euros. Uh, the, um, actually, to apply to all uh, young and employed Europeans the, the initiative, you would, uh, I think, if, I, my, if my recollection is correct, you would need around 23 billion euros. So you, we are short of uh, 17 billion euros. Uh, the way to uh, uh, fill this gap is to use, of course, national uh, resources and also to re uh, re redirect 
structural funds, the, 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 the social fund, for mm -hmm. example. Um, now, this poses a problem, a challenge for many European countries, because if you want to match the uh, European funds with national funds, then you have to, um, uh, you risk to uh, over, over, uh, overtake your limits, uh, yeah. the, the growth and stability pact's limits. And um, the movement from, from what I've been told is that uh, there has been a, a less uh, a less strong, less marked division between those more uh, uh, fiscal <laughs> um, orthodox countries and those countries who say we want to respect the goals but we need some uh, a degree of flexibility because if we have to match the funds for the European Youth Initiative then maybe you should not consider those funds as part of the um, of the deficit, or you should, um, uh, I mean, give a, 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 a special consideration. I mean, of course, there wasn't, uh, it didn't come out a, a solution, but uh, I'm told that debate was very constructive. So there is a comprehension, a general comprehension now that if we want these programs to work and we need to complement European funds with national funds, uh, a degree of flexibility has to be considered. Mm. Um, it's, it's always a, a, a tricky, tricky one to balance. I, I, many, many years ago, I uh, used to run a structural funded project, and it was difficult enough to, to get your match funders. So I can see where maybe the concern would, would, would come in that. Um, I'm happy to open to, I think Alec Rowley's got um, on this theme, wants to pick up um, from here, Alec. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming along this morning, Ambassador. Um, does that not raise the issue in terms of looking forward and coming out of recession, the, the, the difficulty between looking at growth and enforcing austerity measures on countries? And we've seen it with the, the UK economy, and we've had you know, austerity measures that have impacted on public services, on jobs. Instead of reducing the debt, our debt has actually continued to rise. So where is the balance between, between austerity and achieving economic growth? Well, the, um, the line that has been taken by the Italian government is, uh, is quite clear. We are going to respect all the uh, parameters all the obligations. So, for example, we, we will be, will be keeping our budget below, our deficit below the 3% ceiling. And this we are going to do to have the uh, uh, credibility, to have the possibility of uh, saying that uh, those rules should maybe reconsidered uh, in a more flexible way. But we think that if we did not respect it, the present obligations, uh, there would be a credibility issue. I mean, that um, there are some countries, particularly the southern peri periphery of, of Europe, that they are reluctant to respect obligations. So we say, well, at the moment we are going to respect obligation, and this is costing us uh, uh, three uh, um, dips recession. We are still in recession now. Um, but uh, on the same time, will uh, give us the moral authority to say we should maybe reconsider some uh, parameters that were set in a different Europe, in a different conditions. Um, take for example, I, uh, apart from, uh, but you know that then we added uh, further constraints with the fiscal compact. Uh, the fiscal compact. Uh, Italy has a balanced budget uh, because we, are, we have been running a primary surplus for the last 20 years uh, and, and we, we have always been below 3%. Uh, but we should go, do more because we still have, we have the legacy of the past. We have a huge debt, which is now 132% of the GDP. Uh, this huge debt uh, we, we manage because uh, while other countries double their deficit, their debt, sorry. Um, we, path, we, we went from 124, 25 to 132. So 
during the, the recession, so it was a, a marginal increase, due also to the fact that Italy contributed with 17% to all the rescue programs of other uh, southern uh, periphery countries and setting up of the SM as well. But anyway, uh, the uh, fiscal compact would say that uh, as of next year, you should reduce by one-tenth your uh, debt GDP ratio. Uh, this would, um, would mean today uh, a, a fiscal of adjustment equivalent to 4%, uh, four uh, um, percentage points of GDP, so a huge adjustment. But when the fiscal compact was conceived, this process of reduction of debt would have um, amounted, would have translated into a, a, a not 0.5% of readjustment. Why? Because uh, the, uh, it was calculated at the time that we would have 2% inflation and 1.5% growth. So actually, with that 35 you would uh, be left only with uh, uh, not 0.5 percent of adjustment to reduce the debt uh, accordingly to the fiscal compact. But now, the, if we, were, we have deflation, there is no growth, so what was uh, not 0.5 percent is 4 percent. So maybe uh, those, all these figures should be adjusted to the changing economic reality. But again, it's a matter of credibility, so uh, we are going on to respect them but we make the case that probably they should be reconsidered. Okay, thank you. Can I pick up a, a different issue? You, you, you talked about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, TTIP. In, in Scotland, I think indeed across the UK, there is concern of what the implications of that agreement would be, um, particularly on the National Health Service. Um, and, and there is, I think, a strong body opinion um, that the National Health Service within Scotland and within the UK should not be um, in any way included within, within any agreement if an agreement is reached. What would be your view on that? Um, well, to my knowledge, the, uh, the, of course, uh, this implies uh, uh, that in, in the agreement you have the, health, the, the private sector somehow covered by the agreement. Uh, to my knowledge, well, here in Scotland you should be quite, uh, quite safe from that point of view because the private sector has a very, very small role uh, played here. But nevertheless, I mean, I think that in this, uh, this fields, uh, if particular uh, concerns can be taken to consideration. Uh, Italy has a different concern, is the protection of uh, geographic origin of products, for example. Uh, France has the cultural exception. But the way uh, forward, I think, is to consider, <coughs> to take into consideration all the local and national concerns, but without, without uh, going as far as a so-called carving out, that you uh, exclude completely that uh, sector from the agreement, because then uh, this is the way to empty the agreement, because everyone will just take a chunk out uh, and put it aside. So I think the agreement has to remain comprehensive, but each party can uh, ask legitimately some guarantee on specific issues of concerns. And I think they, they can be fairly easily arranged, those guarantees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claire Adamson. Good morning, Your Excellency. Well, uh, welcome to our committee this morning. Um, I um, welcomed your introductory remarks, very, very comprehensively setting out um, the, the priorities. Um, I was particularly... Um, struck by um, your commitment to human rights of, of great concern to this committee. And I welcome the fact that you mentioned the gender balance and um, the European boards. I, I should say I mentioned already at committee this morning a little bit of disappointment in the commissioners not having a gender balance in the, the current um, cohort. I don't expect you to respond to that, though. <laughs> Just a comment at the moment. Um, 
the area I would like to, to examine further with you, um, and one of very great concern to us facing a UK election next year with um, a rise in the polls and, and in um, representation of, of Europhobic parties and the fact that the UK could be facing an in-out referendum on Europe. Um, Scotland traditionally has, has been much more Europhile um, and indeed our Conservative member who is not here today is a Europhile himself, um, um, uh, perhaps um, somewhat unique in his party at the moment. But Scotland definitely has a different attitude to Europe. Um, so given that we're facing, uh, uh, in a very short time, the general election, could you um, give us some practical uh, examples of what help could be given in terms of, of your priority with European citizens' confidence and engaging with their citizens and the opportunity to explain to them what the benefits of, of European membership are at this stage? Well, yes, first of all, on the, uh, the gender balance, um, as you know, the presidency has no role in um, forming the new commission. So uh, if any blame there is, should be put at the, at the feet of um, Jacqueline's boss, <laughs> Mr. Juncker. <laughs> um, but I guess that was, it, it is, uh, honestly, it's very difficult. You have so many balances to, to strike there, north, south, east, west, um, smaller, bigger countries, uh, left, right wing parties, uh, and then of course, well, I think it, it is a shame that uh, gender balance was not on the top of the priority. It was just one of the different, uh, um, because I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, I, I've, I always apply the gender balance within my the offices uh, of which I've been having responsibilities along my career, and always the, the best uh, uh, colleagues I had were always uh, ladies. So I, um, I was the first, when I was chief of staff, principal private secretary, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, I was the first one who, who got a, a gender balance in the private office. And I also uh, accepted there were one or two who was in, uh, were going to have a maternity leave. And that was considered a big scandal because you normally don't take a lady who will, will disappear for a couple of months in a ve very tough uh, jobs. But I, I, I took the risk and I think I was rewarded because uh, it worked perfectly well. She was even working from home, uh, being grateful for having been included in this uh, office. Anyway, uh, now to the most uh, difficult issue of uh, how to counter populism in, 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 in europhobic movements in, in Europe. I think that the, you can do uh, many things uh, regarding the institutions, the role of, of European Parliament, national parliament, but I think the, the, the main issue is uh, getting Europe to do what it, it is important for uh, European citizens. So if we can show that Europe is playing a concrete positive role in fostering growth and creating jobs, we are uh, giving an answer to the demand of security. Actually, our, what do our citizens ask institutions? Security. You have an economic security, growth and jobs. And you have the more traditional security, the borders, migration, uh, terrorism, uh, threats, and all that. So the effort should be now to, to get Europe uh, back to uh, the core business of responding to the demands coming from, from the citizen. We have been discussing for too long uh, on uh, austerity versus flexibility and you know all this, the system, how we should we select the European, um, the President of the European Commission? That has been the centre of our debate. Now, at the centre of our debate is we have to find a way to give, uh, to put role, uh, Europe in a condition to give a real contribution to growth and job creation. Thank you very much, Willie Coffey.
Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Ambassador. I wonder if I could carry on with the theme that my colleague Claire Adamson raised there. Um, you mentioned Italy's three priorities, one being job-friendly, second being closer to European citizens, and thirdly, strengthening the role for the European Union in foreign policy. I think we could argue that the second priority, bringing Europe closer to its citizens, could be argued to be one of the most important because of the, the reasons that you've mentioned there, the rise of Europhobic parties throughout the European Union. Now, Italy, as we know, is a founding member of the European Union and has, is held in great respect in Scotland for the role that your country has played over many, many years. And I certainly see the role that Italy can play in reaching out to citizens without, within the European Union is very strong and very important. But how do you think we can connect more directly with the citizen on the ground? If, if you look at the distance between a citizen and the institutions of their own national parliament or with the European Union, it's a greater distance, I think, isn't it, between the ordinary citizen and the European Union institutions? How can we bridge that gap, bring the European Union institutions closer to ordinary citizens so that they understand it, what's going on there and the, and the benefits of what the European Union can deliver for ordinary people? Well, I think that the, the answer is in the, the reform of the European Union. We should show that we are, uh, the, the, the polit European political class has understood that there is such a gap. And um, for example, if you uh, manage to give some concrete substance to the principle of attribution, subsidiarity and proportionality, you are, I think, uh, creating a better connection between the different layers of governance in Europe, the European, the national, uh, the, um, the local, and so on. Um, we have been, again, this is, um, I think, too many times we have had meetings in Europe where uh, at the end, you end up having a talk shop and you speak about subsidiarity, proportionality, and, <laughs> and you don't um, really get to, uh, to the drawboard and, 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 and design something concrete. It just thinks that you think that there should be done something, but there is no project. Now, the, um, I think, again, uh, and this is the connection with what I was saying before, uh, the economic crisis, recession, unemployment, they are all helping us to focus our minds and see, uh, take the youth unemployment initiative, for example. Uh, the, it has been calculated that, as I was saying, the cost would be 23 billion euros, but the absent, I mean, if you don't apply, if you don't uh, make it real, uh, the cost has been calculated to 153 billion because all the benefits that are paid, the um, less revenue that you get from people who's not, uh, they are not working and so on. So it, it makes economic sense to, uh, to make these initiatives reals, real. And to make them real, you, you, you need uh, all the layers to work together. So I, why should this uh, work now that hasn't worked for the last 20 years? Because I think that citizens are really fed up <laughs> and people is sensing. Uh, in my country, people, you can sense really that people won't change and they are convinced that we need to change if we want to, to secure a future for ourselves and our children. And, and, and this global focusing of mind, I think, can can make the difference and help bridging the gap. Do you see um, a role for perhaps technology, digital technology, yeah. to be able to reach out to ordinary citizens? Because what I see living in Scotland and living in the United Kingdom is that the, the media, the newspaper media in the UK in particular, is very hostile to Europe and the population pick this up and it, it leads to some of the circumstances that you've, you've mentioned there. So can you see a role for digital technology to, to reach out to ordinary citizens in Europe to provide a, 
a counterbalancing positive message for citizens within the Union? I think so, because this is, uh, I mean, you can see this also at uh, national, local level, that you can use ICT to, uh, to reach out to, to your citizens. You can make all administrative, even, uh, judicial processes quicker, more transparent uh, using ICT. And ICT is one of the three major uh, legs of the um, Connecting Europe project. You, know, you have transport, <coughs> you have energy, and you have ICT. So, um, for ex again, if, you, if we manage, for example, also to, uh, to make as quickly as possible uh, the Connecting Europe project reality, and you have better transport, better connectivity at transport level, then you have energy and you have interconnection, so <clears throat> you have more security and, and certainly less expensive energy for citizens and, and business as well. And finally, ICT. ICT can make uh, the political, the, the polity work better in Europe in general and can also complement a very important part of the single market, which is the e-commerce. Uh, this is, I think it would be important that we, the future of commerce is, I think it's e-commerce. Now we have 28 different markets. We should make a single market and people would then be able to uh, acquire goods and services at lower prices. And you could show, sh you could show easily that there is a good side. There's not only the negative side of Europe, there is a good side. The problem that, of course, it's always easy to look at the... This is what the press normally does. Uh, they look at the negative news, not the positive news. So there should be also an effort. But through ICT, this effort of uh, putting, uh, sh shedding some light on the positive side of Europe could certainly achieve more easily, I think. That's very encouraging. I have time for just one more... Very brief question, just on, on Italy's priorities again and the, the digital single market that we're about to, to go into there, D does Italy see any priorities in trying to flatten out the costs of mobile telephone charges throughout the European Union because they vary quite considerably? Is there any uh, yeah. move perhaps from the Italian government to do some work on that? Yes, we have been proposing to abolish uh, roaming around Europe, for example, and... Uh, <clears throat> We, the idea of completing, you know, the, the, it's oddly enough, uh, the, we, we managed to, to create a single market for goods relatively quickly. And then what was more modern, in a way, was the service sector. That it should have come first. It's lagging behind. Uh, and there are, uh, if I can, for one time, uh, <laughs> coming from the south of Europe, uh, just playing the part of the first of the class, uh, we have been opening up uh, completely our service uh, industry. There are countries that you would not suspect, uh, such as Germany, that haven't opened up the service industry. And they, I think they should, it's high time that they open up the service sector, because if you open up in Germany, you have a, an invitation effect. I mean, of course, all the, the countries that normally follow uh, the German line, they would certainly be, feel obliged to open up as well. And then they would have to invest because their service sector not being open, by definition, is not efficient. So they should invest in their service sector. They would create opportunities for other countries because they could export services there. But at the same time, they would, as I said, they would invest in their own markets and they would... Uh, create demand and, uh, and, and uh, foster, uh, promote growth at German level first and then at the European level. And this would be a virtuous way to, uh, a virtuous stimulus would n not be just deficit spending, but would be productive investment uh, that would be in, the, in a enlightened self-interest for, for Germany itself. So I really think that, and, and the example that you made, uh, mobile phones, is, um, it's very important because maybe it's less easy to uh, explain to people 
that if we open up the service sector, then you have cheaper insurances, policies, and you have a better service in the insurance sector, which is very, very close in many countries. Uh, if you speak of mobile phones, you can have a popular pressure to say, well, I want to spend less. I, want, I don't want to pay roaming when I go on holiday in Spain or Greece. <clears throat> and why should I pay these outrageous bills if I know that I know in the States they pay one-tenth of that? Uh, well, in the States, mobile phones don't work very well, but it's another story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question for today, Rod Campbell. I've got three separate questions, if I can. Um, first question is in relation to migration. Obviously, pressures on the European Union from migration from outside, and indeed, obviously, um, the important issue of human trafficking. You referred to the three ministerial meetings. Can, can, is, there, is there a plan in the European Union of what is, what's the, well, really, what is the plan? Where, where, is the, 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 these, where are these discussions going? What's the objective? I, I, we wish there were a clearer plan. Uh, the truth is, to be, uh, to be honest with you, is that with, uh, we have been left quite alone to face this tragedy. We had 100,000 migrants arriving on Sicilian shores only this year. And to face this, we have an agency with limited means, Frontex, so that we, have, we had to create a national program uh, called Mare Nostrum to rescue <clears throat> all the, those migrants that have been drowning by a thousand in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, <clears throat> we are pressing to, to uh, persuade the European Union that uh, there is an external border which is of common interest and should be managed at a common level. <clears throat> this means that uh, you should have not just the Italian Navy patrolling the... And in fact, a, a, a progress is this new Triton operation where for the first time we are not... The Italian Navy is not left alone in uh, tackling this, this issue, uh, coping with this, uh, this uh, potential continuous tragedy. Um, <clears throat> but then we should also press... We are working together on the development aid. Uh, of course, the, uh, the what happens in the Mediterranean is the last uh, phase of a process which starts in sub-Saharan countries where you have migrants uh, uh, desperate, and they cross the desert, they get to the Mediterranean shores, and they, they jump on, on the first boat to try to, to reach Sicily, and then these people trafficking in human beings, they uh, willingly they, they use boats that will not be able to, to reach their destination, that they will probably sunk, uh, sink in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, because then they just disappear, they leave the, the, the migrants there, and the migrants are taken on board and then uh, uh, brought to uh, uh, centers in Lampedusa or in Sicily or Calabria and the southern regions of Italy. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you have to work at, uh, with the countries of origin, uh, the Rabat process, for example, to try to better coordinate uh, aid to create uh, economic opportunities, jobs in, in, in those countries that can discourage these people to leave their homes in, in looking for a better future. <clears throat> but then you have the transit countries, Libya, Tunisia, uh, Algeria, and there you should persuade, and it, it, it's needed, uh, the, the whole European pressure, and it is, Italy is not enough, of course, uh, to persuade these countries to have agreements with the uh, Commission of Ref the UN um, uh, Refugee Commission, um, so that you can create centers there on the shore uh, in Tunisia, Libya, where these people arrive. And there you can maybe assist with European funds, you can assist these people and try to send them back to their homes while hope, in the meantime, hopefully the development aid will have 
created opportunities for them. And then you can uh, distinguish the economic uh, migrants from refugees coming from Syria, from the areas of war, and their application could be dealt with there, in Libya, Tunisia, and they could then uh, receive possibly a, an a asylum and they could travel normally, safely, to the country who's going to receive them. <clears throat> so you see, it's a whole, um, you have the three uh, country of origin where you have to work together for creating opportunities. Then you have the country of transit where you should create centers for migrants there. And then you have the patrolling of the Mediterranean Sea. There is, it's not possible that just one country with occasional help of Malta or, or Greece can cope with such a, a big issue. So we are pressing uh, on the other partners to make this a European priorities and all, um, I mean, um, all political uh, pressure is welcome to create awareness of the scale of the phenomenon. Thank you, Ambassador. You've mentioned Syria there briefly, which is my next point. Um, ISIS, Syria, the problems there, to what extent is um, Italy and its, its role as uh, president of the EU at the moment kind of taking a lead in that issue, or is that not really registering on the radar? Well, you see, uh, <clears throat> there the, the lead has been taken by the United States. So we are uh, having a complementary role at European level. It's a very national, this is uh, it's a typical case where it's difficult to have a, a single foreign policy. You have different national uh, policies. We, as, as far as Italy is concerned, we support the, um, the, EU, the US action. Uh, and we are materially not supporting, we politically support them in Syria. We support them and other, with, with other European partners in Iraq, or the strikes in Iraq. We are not at the moment uh, <clears throat> uh, taking part in strikes, but we do refueling, we do humanitarian aid, we do training, but we are not uh, averse to, if there is a general European participation, we would be uh, considering also military strikes in Iraq in this phase. And finally, just a point of clarification. We were talking about uh, TTIP earlier on. It, it, were you suggesting that in the UK, because the NHS is predominantly in the public sector, we, we, we shouldn't have concerns about uh, um, the impact on the health service here? Um, obviously, the NHS south of the border has increasing elements of the private sector. But, I mean, we may have picked that up wrong, or I may have picked that up wrong. Could you just clarify that point? Well, it's not for me to, to describe what is the state of the art of your uh, health service. I, I know that here uh, in England there is some, uh, a greater role uh, of the private sector, but I think it's still marginal. And uh, I, from what I gather, this parliament has uh, competence on the health sector. So I think that you have already control of... Uh, the health sector and it's up to you to guarantee to your citizens and, and protect their rights. Uh, you are lucky enough to have this beautiful parliament, you will be certainly be able to protect your citizens' rights. Okay, on that note, can I thank you very much, Ambassador. We've explored many areas uh, this morning. As you can see, we have a very um, active committee who uh, takes great um, pride in the, the role that they play on the committee. Um, but on behalf of the committee this morning, can I formally say thank you very much. Um, and um, to, to all involved, and thank you for your lovely concert last night. We all very much enjoyed it. And I'm going to close the session now. But can I remem remind uh, colleagues to stay behind for the official photograph with the Ambassador? Thank, thank you. you.